The story that was brought to me, the, 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 the history of it is actually pretty interesting. Um, Jerry Bruckheimer optioned the book, um, the, which was called The Weather Night at the time. Right. And, uh, you know, it's a memoir of uh, Ralph Sarchi, uh, you know, you know, the basic story. And, um, and he was looking for writers, you know, and you, uh, I went and met with him. And he, his basic take was, he, you know, he said he wanted to make Serpico meets The Exorcist, which I thought was the fucking coolest no thing I've ever heard. Yeah. So, and this is in 1994. So I got the job, wrote, wrote the first draft, did a couple of drafts of the script then, and, um, and he decided, or the folks at Brookheimer decided to uh, have another writer come on at that point. I was not involved as a director. Well, while I was writing the script, I went to New York and I spent a week with, with Ralph Starch. He got to know him really well. And, um, and Ralph was the guy who introduced me to the case of Annalise Michelle and gave me an out-of-print photocopy of a book called The Exorcism of Annalise Michelle, which uh, I took home with me and read and then optioned for $100 and turned into The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Wow. <laughs> True story. That's crazy. That and is so insane. then, you know, during the next, whatever that was then, uh, six years, seven years, uh, there were three other writers that went through um, the Where the Night uh, trying to, you know, supposedly improve the script. Um, and then after I had finished Sinister, uh, Screen Gems, Sony Screen Gems asked me what I wanted to do, ne- to do next. And I told them, you know, there's this project I wrote for Brookheimer way back in the day that I loved. And they read my first draft and said, well, we want to make it. So I read the draft, felt like after, you know, Emily Rose was one of those movies that, that um, kind of reinvigorated the exorcism film, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and it, after that was the paranormal activity movies and, and demon possession movies, and, and uh, there, were, there was just a lot that was done in the subgenre, and so I didn't feel like that draft was, was good enough. I read, I read the other drafts by the other writers. There was a few things I liked in them, but none of them that I would want to make. So I then took... Uh, some time and rewrote a, a new draft um, that's the movie that I shot and, and that's, uh, that's kind of how it happened now talk about the movie that you shot um, the title was changed um, I don't know if it, at what point it was but I know we were on it was, set it was changed after the movie was finished now how do you feel about the title change was that your call and what was the uh, thinking about of changing something as you know I'm not that precious about titles I know some filmmakers are I, I want people to go see the movie so I, I kind of trust the marketing departments yeah. um, you know they do their research but Where the Night was always a cool title I never thought that would end up being the title just because 80% of the time people would call it the Where of the Night so they would say it wrong right Chargers, that's a problem also sounds like We Own the Night it's a play it's a play on We Own the Night the NYPD you know phrase and, and uh, which um you know, it, it, there was already a movie called that. I just, I didn't, I never thought that was going to end up being the title. Uh, and the fact that they, you know, ended up um, getting a title that, uh, you know, was originated by Jesus Christ. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Some movie. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Now, you worked with Ralph initially. You, you know, you know the man, but has he seen the film? No, you know, he he, he didn't want to see it until the premiere. Okay. Um, he, by, by his choice, he's deliberately not watching it because he wants to, he wants the excitement of seeing it for the first time in the premiere. That's what he told me. I mean, he was our on set police. Uh, he was our on set police um, advisor. Uh, not 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 to 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 give um, information. Not to be an advisor to the story that we were telling about him at all. Mm-hmm. He he you know he knew that I was shooting the script that I wrote and he had read the script and and, and liked the script. But he was the guy who was on set to make sure that, you know, Eric Bana and Joel McHale wore their guns right and knew how to clear a room properly. So I, almost every day there was something where I had to say, Ralph, how, 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 what, what would really happen here if an NYPD cop was in this situation? What would they do? Um, so he was, he was there almost every day uh, on the production. So he saw most of the movie getting shot, but he hasn't seen the actual picture. Now, you mentioned that the original idea, the pitch was, and it's a beautiful one, was uh, The Exorcist meets Serpico, right? Yeah. Yeah. So how much of the, the okay, is it, is it a cop thriller with supernatural or horror elements in it, or is it a horror film with, with cops elements? I mean, which, which do you think it is, is its strongest genre suit? I mean, I think it's, I think it's really 100% both. I, mean, I, took the same, I took the same attitude toward it. I, 
I wouldn't even. Here's the thing. You know, we we did. It's the highest testing movie that I've ever done in terms of audience tests. Mm-hmm. And it, and and the movie is scary. I mean, it's you know, and that was definitely one of the overarching things. The audiences loved it because it was scary. However, when they when the audience was were asked, you know, is this horror or is this a supernatural thriller? Even though it's a it's a hard R, it's a graphic R rated film. They still call it a supernatural thriller. I think some, sometimes people do that because they, you know, to them horror is a, is, is a lesser word. I don't right. think that way, but sometimes audiences do. So I do think that it's it's um, it is uh, it is absolutely as much a supernatural thriller as it is a horror film. I mean, as it is a a, a, a cop movie, a cop procedural. I, that was always the goal. It was to I didn't want it to be half cop movie and half you know, horror film. I wanted it to be 100% both, and I think it, I think that it, it achieves that pretty well. In the same way that Emily Rose was every bit as much a courtroom movie as it was a horror film, it's kind of, it kind of functions as both all the way through. Now, is it the same, um, I mean, the aesthetic approach, the, the balancing the realities of, of, the, of the true story versus what audiences want out of a supernatural horror film is a bit daunting, but you did that with Emily Rose already, so was it pretty much the same... I'm not going to say formula, but the same aesthetic approach to, to sculpting the movie? You're talking about fidelity to the, to the true story or just the, the real-life elements, the non-paranormal elements? Well, balancing both the phantasmagorical and what people, I guess, a general audience is want yeah, out of Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it, here's my... Here's the, the, way I, the way I look at that balance is that a, a horror film or a supernatural thriller has a, an innate rhythm where you take the audience into creepy scenes and then into supernatural scenes and the those scenes will escalate into shock and horror and then you need relief and in a, most horror films whether it's a slasher film or a ghost story uh, or a zombie movie what exists between the set pieces or between the scary scenes and the thrilling scenes tends to be um, just straight character dialogue and um, in, in lesser films, you know, in a, in a good, cheap slasher film, it's just teenagers usually yammering about nothing. In, in both Emily Rose and in this movie, I respected that rhythm. I think that rhythm works for a reason. But I wanted, when we come down from the scary sequences, I didn't want to come down into just m- meaningless dialogue or just, just even straight character dialogue. I wanted to come down into procedural, compelling storytelling. You know, so in the same way with Emily Rose, I wanted to come down into compelling courtroom debate, right. and and so the the goal was to never have any functional scenes, never have any scenes that are just straight exposition or kind of meaningless character uh, moments, but that everything was was moving the story forward in a, in significant ways that that were compelling in their own right, and I, and I think the other unique element to this movie compared to you know, something like Emily Rose, which was kind of a pure hybrid of two things. Deliver Us From Evil is really a hybrid of, of, of a supernatural thriller, a cop procedural, and an action film. You know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of bursts of action in it. Um, there's, you know, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a three-minute knife fight in the movie, you know. I mean, there's, there's things in it that are uh, kind of unexpected bursts of action, and, and I don't know, I just felt that, that it was a movie, there's a little bit of a kitchen sink approach to it, which I always loved, and I always wanted it to have, and, and I 